Welcome back to more questions in the comments. It's been a really busy day. I've done a few videos today because I won't get a chance to do them later in the week. So I'm still going to commit. I'm going to do daily videos on Black Belt Secrets, picking up on your questions because there's lots of them coming through thick and fast. So I'm going to pick up on some of those, but I also want to talk about something which is really more of a discussion that did come out of one of the questions in the comments, but I'm offering it up more of a discussion. It's to do with the right to silence in the UK and whether or not there is in fact a right to silence. And I'm going to offer this by way of a discussion because it fits in with the police caution and it's all relative. So the police caution is you do not have to say anything. Obviously that relates to the right to silence. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defense if you do not mention when questioned something you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Now, a lot of people think that the police have to tag on to this, do you understand? But in fact, they don't. That's not part of the caution or it's not an official part of the caution, although most police officers probably do ask that question. But overall, the caution is giving the suspect an opportunity to volunteer early, at probably the earliest opportunity, a reason or an explanation or whatever it is that they are being asked. Now, a lot of people that are proponents of the right to silence will say that, you know, the police can try to fit something in from what they've said and construe what they say to use against them. But others that are against the right to silence are likely to say, well, honest people are going to just say everything as it is and they're not going to need to remain silent. And I can see both arguments there. And the reason is, on the one hand, the argument could go that if the police do turn up and they say, you know, where were you at this point in time because we were investigating X, Y and Z. If you know exactly where you were and you were not there, why would you not say, well, I've been here all day. I've been working. I've been on conference calls. I've been doing my videos. I've been doing this, that and the other answering emails, all of which point to me being here. My phone GPS tells everybody that I was here, so on and so forth. Why would I not do that if that would completely absolve me of being out in town at, you know, nine, 10 o'clock this morning, which I wasn't. So in that sense, I can understand people arguing against the right to silence because why would you not offer up the genuine truth if it absolves you? However, the reverse argument would be in the situation where you do not necessarily know what a legal defense might be, or you do not necessarily know if you say something in a particular way that it's going to be used to construe some sort of guilt on your part. Perhaps just because you say it badly or wrongly or you say the wrong thing. Or if you panic and you say something that isn't really quite true. For example, taking the case of self-defense. If you said something along the lines of, well, I know that I can use this for self-defense if I need to, then that might be construed as you having something with you which would be considered an offensive weapon because your intention on the object would make that an offensive weapon. But on the other hand, you may not actually have taken it with you for that purpose. You may know that you could use it for self-defense, but if you say that to a police officer and you don't really mean that you took it with you by way of self-defense, it may later be construed that you had it with you as an offensive weapon, which of course would be detrimental to any argument you make vis-a-vis -vis self defense because you had an offensive weapon with you. Offensive weapon by virtue of the fact that you intended to use it to cause harm. Contrast that with the position where if you took legal advice and the lawyer asks you very pertinent questions and says, well, why did you take this with you? And you say, well, I always have it with me in case I need it. Uh, I used the example of my vlogging stick in the previous video. So if you have that with you, because I regularly like to record content and increasingly so, I'm going to make more videos for these channels. I may very well have my vlogging stick with me. It could be used as a weapon, but that's not my intention for carrying it with me. My point is if someone says the wrong thing, i.e. something they don't really mean when they are questioned by a police officer, then it might entrap them into some kind of guilt that they really shouldn't be because ultimately that's not what they meant. So therefore the right to silence is an important thing because when being questioned, there is no obligation, outright obligation to answer those questions. But 
Is it a full-blown right to silence? This is where the discussion really comes in. Because if something is a right, then by virtue of it being a right, there should ideally be no detriment to you exercising that right. However, when you exercise, let's call it your right to silence, either when being questioned or when you get to court because a defendant does not have to give evidence in court, cannot be compelled to give evidence against himself in court, if those rights are exercised, there will usually be uh, what we call an adverse inference drawn by a jury. Adverse meaning negative, inference being something that they may think as a result and consequence of events that have happened. So they may think negatively of the fact that the defendant failed to mention when questioned something that he is now relying on in court as part of his defence. Now, of course, there's a lot of rules around this and there are rules around defence statements and rules around pre-prepared statements, which can be read out in interview and rules around whether or not a defendant has relied on legal advice to go no comment in the interview. So one of these rules, by way of example, a defendant who is advised to go no comment in the interview, his lawyer potentially sees that as a person that the interview is going to go very badly for and on balance probably better that he doesn't answer the questions. However, there will still be an adverse inference drawn and he cannot just say, well, I relied on legal advice to do no comment interview and therefore that's the end of it. It's not as simple as that. There will be an adverse inference drawn because he could choose whether or not to follow that legal advice. The legal advice stands on its own and the defendant or the suspect at that stage can choose whether or not to follow that advice. That's why it is absolutely not clear cut. You should always take formal legal advice and everything like this turns into a rather interesting discussion. So that was my discussion that I wanted to do at the beginning of this video, which came out of one or two comments, which actually was about a week or two ago. But I thought that might be interesting. Let's on with some more. Inclusive Driving asks an interesting question. Inclusive Driving is a driving instructor. Check their channel out. Says that in the absence of a no U-turn sign, is it permitted to do a U-turn at a traffic light displaying right turn filter arrow? Uh, inclusive Driving's opinion is that it would not be permitted and I would agree. There's very little actually on U-turns at traffic lights in the highway code, but there is something that refers to the green filter arrow, which is rule 177, which is what I would rely on if I was answering this question. Rule 177 says, green filter arrow, this indicates filter lane only. Do not enter that lane unless you want to go in the direction of the arrow. You may proceed in the direction of the green arrow when it or the full green light shows. Give other traffic, especially cyclists, time and room to move into the correct lane. So for me, I would rely on rule 177, ruling out the idea of doing a U-turn at a traffic light that has a green filter arrow. So whilst it doesn't expressly say you cannot do the U-turn, it says it by elimination in my view. So yes, absolutely, I agree with you. Fergus also offers up another question. Uh, what would my reaction to someone telling me that they are sui juris or sui genesis, which essentially means that they are of their own right, their own governance, and they are unique in and of themselves and they don't submit to anyone else's uh, control or governance. Well, in this situation, taking the United Kingdom as an example, if you are here, then you are going to be treated as being subject to the laws of the United Kingdom, um, or whether you like it or not, because the people of the United Kingdom elect a government, which then through the Westminster Parliament, which is the supreme lawmaking body, will enact laws. And that is how the United Kingdom is ruled and governed. And so whether someone consents to be governed like that or not doesn't really make any difference. They are free to hold those beliefs, and indeed I will fight for their right to hold those beliefs, but their right to manifest those beliefs can be legitimately curtailed, and that's what the law does. And Paul Amos, not a question, just a shout out, because Paul Amos says, very interesting, always enlightening, learnt a lot in just a few weeks of watching Black Belt Barrister videos, and even more with general Q&A walk and talk. So thank you for watching, Paul. I'm glad you enjoy the content. In fact, I hope you all enjoy the content. I certainly enjoy making it. 
it makes for long days around my other work, but hey, I love it, so I'm gonna keep doing it. Nick Duffy asks a more serious question. Uh, if bailiffs turn up with police, uh, why do that? It's intimidating. TV license, do the same. What can you do when you've done nothing wrong? But what you can do, Nick, is first of all, you can ask to examine the warrant and you can make a full note of everything that's on it. If it were me, I'd be taking a photograph of it because I don't see that there'd be any secrecy around that warrant and they should allow me to take a copy of it or photograph it, or at the very least make a note of all the details on it. And I would probably personally film the entire thing because if anything goes wrong or if there's anything intimidating, I would want to be able to rely on that later. There is nothing wrong with you making a recording of it for your own personal record so that you can refer to it later. So if there is any wrongdoing or if there was anything wrong with the warrant in the first place, you can refer back to that and you can take appropriate action. What I wouldn't recommend doing is fighting it, even if you believe it to be wrong, because if it does turn out to be wrong, it's better that you didn't risk obstructing the warrant in the first place. But if it does turn out to be wrong, you can take necessary steps afterwards, which would include wrongful entry and various other things, for which obviously you would need to seek for more legal advice. 2110FSX, if that is your real name, on the Black Belt Barrister channel this time asks, as I understand it, the warrants can be printed off by themselves and do not need to be signed by the court. Is this correct? What's the legal process followed in obtaining a warrant to enter a property? So I have dealt with this a couple of times. This particular question was in relation to TV licensing. So that's correct. It doesn't need to be signed or with a wet signature as it's sometimes known, which is a real pen signature. They can just be noted with an electronic name, usually the magistrate's name at the bottom to indicate they've endorsed the warrant. Obviously falsifying a document like that is going to be fraud, so no one should realistically be doing that. But a warrant from a court very often will just have an electronic signature at the bottom. And in fact, there is a court in the west of London, which is a warrants court. And pretty much most of what they do is endorsing and issuing warrants based on applications. So the application will come in electronically and the warrant will go back electronically for enforcement. Big Baldy Bear, if that is your real name, uh, says in response to my who has the right of way when merging video over on Black Belt Barrister at 2 minutes 26, when I'm talking about signaling your intentions to move over, asks, what if you're in a BMW? Well, same rules apply, I'm afraid. Even people in BMWs should use those sticks on the side of the steering wheel that go up and down and tell other cars which direction they're going in. What happens is you move it up, the lights on the right side of the car flash to indicate that you're turning right. And if you flick it down, usually the lights on the left-hand side of the car flash indicate you're moving left. So whether you're changing lanes, turning left or turning right, that's what they're for. And again, not really a question, but back, B-A-K, if that is your real name, says, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this timely run through the Consumer Rights Act, as I'm currently doing a battle with a car dealer who refuses to honor his obligations and feels a little more armed with the knowledge. So thank you very much, back. I'm pleased that you enjoyed that video. I know that when I do consumer rights type videos, they are not quite as popular as my other sort of videos that tell people they don't know what the road signs are and things like that. But nonetheless, they are useful videos that go in the library because at some point, every one of you is going to come across something that you will need to resort to this library for. So I'm building up the library. So there's almost everything in there. I've even covered the Party Wall Act. Obviously, I've covered the Consumer Rights Act. I cover drones, driving, offenses, self-defense, you name it. So I really like to cover as many topics as I can. If you've got topics you want me to cover, become a channel member, drop me some super chats in the live streams on Sundays. That way they will float to the top. I get hundreds, if not thousands of questions, comments, emails, and I try to get as many as I can done. So for now, I think I'm going to wrap up and see how long this video is so far, uh, get it ready to upload. And I've still got some more work to do before, what time is it now? It's uh, quarter past two now. So, so we'll get these ready for this evening and thank you for watching.